Church, open up your mouth and say, Lord, we cry holy, holy and holy unto you, Lord. Oh, we thank you, Jesus. For we serve a holy God. We thank you, Lord. Oh, Jesus, yes, Lord, we bless you, Jesus. We cry. Everything that 
celebrate Father's Day. I want to wish all of the fathers in this place a, a very happy Father's Day. You have been a tremendous blessing, not only in your house, but in the church and in the society as well. So I want to wish all the fathers a very happy Father's Day. And we pray that God's blessings upon you. And I would like to pray as we uh, bring this service to a close that we want to pray for all the fathers and uh, pray that God will continue to give you the strength, give you the wisdom, give you the anointing to fulfill what God has entrusted in your care. And in line with Father's Day, I want to share with you about the fatherhood of God. The fact that I have a God who loves when I call him, when I enjoy him, when I commune with him as a father, as much as God is my savior, God is my redeemer, God is my righteousness, we have all the names of God that, that is so true, that is so rich, that, that so fascinates us. But I think nothing fascinates the heart of God as much as we as children calling him father. There's something in that name when you utter because it is not just a name but it's a relationship I calling him as father the heart of God just blossoms when he hears me utter him or call him or address him as father but people in the Old Testament did not have the privilege that we have and how is this shift there was a paradigm shift from the Old Testament to the New Testament. I want to begin with saying our God is a family. How many of you believe that God is a family? God has a family. There, is, there was perfect unity. There was perfect love, unity in the community of the Trinity. In the beginning, there was perfect love. There was perfect fellowship. There was perfect community and harmony within the Trinity. And this God who has a family wants to be a relational God. He doesn't want to be a God who is so transcendent, doesn't want to have anything with the affairs of the world, or doesn't want to have anything with me as an individual, doesn't want to relate to me, doesn't want to communicate to me, doesn't want to connect me. I don't serve a God who is transcendent, above, beyond, set apart. But my God, as much as he is transcendent, he is also imminent. God is in me, God is with me, and God is for me. Can I hear an amen? And God, when God created man, as I said, there was perfect love in the community of God. But if the Bible says God is love. For me to love, I need to have an object of love. Agreed? I, if, 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 if I'm a single person, I have nothing to love or no one to love, how can I say that I have love? This is uniquely Christian. Because God, we serve a God, a triune God. He's not just an, an individual, just, not just a, a single person. But my God is a triune God. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit consist of the Godhead. So there was already love existed in the family of God. My point is this. God did not have to create human being to express love. This is uniquely Christian. God doesn't have to create human being to express love. There was already love. There was already communion. There was already fellowship. There was already unity in 
the Trinity. And as I said, this God wants to relate to us. He is a relational God and he created mankind to have fellowship, to commune, to walk, to relate him to himself with <coughs> his own creatures. But the Old Testament people didn't have such a privilege. They, although, <coughs> although Adam and Eve walked with God, talked with God, they have perfect communion, perfect harmony amongst themselves with God and with nature. Such a situation, sin came and disrupted the entire fellowship that mankind enjoyed with God. And ever since, it's like God and people, creator, creation. I am the God and you are people. It's the relationship with God and people was a little different than what we find today. It was just people, God, creator, creation. God used to speak so audibly with prophets and say, this is what I want you to do. This is how you need to lead people. And every time, it's just the, 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 the system was so different. Priest, high priest, offering, all these things we know, it was so different. But never people understood God as a father as much as we understand in the church age and in the New Testament. So from the Old Testament, there was a paradigm shift. How this God, who was a God people, or this kind of a relationship where the fatherhood was not clearly understood by people or enjoyed by people in the Old Testament, there was a big paradigm shift from the Old Testament to the New Testament. It's God, holy God, righteous God, a God who punishes, a God who blesses. And, and when you open the New Testament, suddenly... The fatherhood of God unfolds. Suddenly the sonship unfolds. Suddenly we see the trinity, the, the, the spirit of God being actively in as much as he was in the Old Testament also. So when you open the New Testament, we see Jesus Christ. We see the father. We see God wanting to reveal himself as the loving, gracious father. And he wanted his people to Commune with him as a wonderful, loving, and a compassionate father. I just want to begin with this one question. If you ask anyone, why did Jesus Christ come to this earth? Most of our answer will be to die for us on the sin, to give us salvation, to free us from death. All of this is fine. But I believe the primary reason that Jesus came to this earth is found in John chapter 1, verse 18. Can we have the text on the screen. John chapter 1 verse 18. There's nothing, you know, whatever we have, yeah, that, that's right, that is what Jesus came for. But I believe the primary purpose that Jesus came to this earth is to reveal the Father to us. As much as God is transcendent, as much as we can say he, he stays in unapproachable light, as much as he's an, uh, uh, a transcendent God, he's also an imminent God who wants to come and have fellowship, to share our lives, and to relate and to express himself as a loving father in the day-to-day -day affairs of our world. Amen? This is the primary reason I believe that Jesus has come into this earth. He says, no one has ever seen God, but God, the one and only, who is at the Father's side, has made him, come on, has made him known. Jesus Christ came to make the father know because i did not have a clearer picture of how this father was because i have always related to him as god but jesus said i want to make known the father and he wants to have communion with you he wants to have relationship with you the primary purpose of jesus coming is to make the father known to us so that we can have communion, fellowship, and we can enjoy having God as my heavenly father. This is the primary reason that Jesus came into this earth. And I have a text for us this morning from a very familiar passage of scripture. We know it so well, but we have not understood the depth of it. We have just plainly taken a few things, and we have just vaguely understood saying 
this is the emphasis or the essence of this particular passage. We know it so well that we actually don't know it. A very familiar passage of scripture, Luke chapter 15. What are the three parables that we find there? Luke chapter 15. What we famously call as the parable of the, come on, the first parable, the parable of the lost sheep. Second, the parable of the son or coin. Then these three parables, the, the parable of the lost sheep, the parable of the lost coin, the parable of the lost son. My problem is in this. So we need to understand something. The chapter and the verse division came much, much later. It came only during the 16th century. When the Bible was completed, the Bible was not in this format that we find it today. There was no chapters, there was no division, there was no verses, there was no paragraphs, uh, subtitle, nothing was there. It was from start to beginning, from start it just went on. But for us to make it a little more easy, there shouldn't be any more confusion. There, is, there has to be a little more clarity. People helped us in having chapters and versus division. Sometimes they are very, very nice. Most of the time they are fine. But here and there we see a little, I wouldn't say mistake, but maybe the verse starts here. Every time you look or, or read a, a fresh passage, particularly in the New Testament, we should see where the last verse ends. Because there was a continuity and it was we who put a full stop and pull this paragraph and say this is the next chapter. So every time you read a fresh chapter, make sure you read at least one or two verses prior to that. Only then we'll be able to understand what God has saying or the continuity of the verse. Before we get into chapter 15, I want us to read the last phrase of chapter 14 or the last verse of chapter 14. Chapter 14, the last verse, it talks about salt losing its saltiness. And then you see what do you see the last phrase? He who has ears, let him hear. And then he says, how does chapter 15 verse 1 starts? Okay. Jesus is telling this. I believe it. this is the continuation. He says, he who has ear, let him here, then he is narrating to them what is happening. Now the tax collectors and the sinners were all gathered around to hear Jesus. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered, this man welcomes sinners and eats with them. Every time Jesus says a parable, we have to take few things into consideration so that it will help us to broaden our understanding. We just want to know, who is the audience that Jesus is talking to? Because this is not a real incident. This is a parable. As we said, this is a parable. It's not history. It's not happened somewhere. But Jesus is telling a story. And we need to know who were the original audience. Two groups of people. Number one, the tax collectors and the sinners. On the other side, we have the Pharisees and the teachers of the law. So who is muttering about Jesus? The Pharisees and the teachers of the Lord, they muttered and said, this man, Jesus, is eating in sinners? House. This is the context into which Jesus is giving these particular parables. So if I know who Jesus was addressing it to originally, I will be able to understand it a little more clearer. So the audience to which these three parables were presented were the tax collectors and the Pharisees and the teachers of the law. Now let's come into the parable. Chapter 15 Verse 11. I'll, I'll leave the other two parables and I want to focus on this. The parable of the lost son. I don't think that was the emphasis that Jesus was talking here. Jesus is not emphasizing about the lostness of the son. Okay, I'll agree with you for, for, for the sake of argument. If the parable of the lost son, can you tell me which son? Which son in your understanding of all these years of the Bible reading, which son in your opinion was the lost son? Many of you will say the younger son because he took money, he went, he did everything. So he was the lost son. So the, the point that Jesus is making here is not describing about the lostness of man, but he's describing as a seeking father. How a father seeks 
Because what is the parable prior to that? What is the parable prior to that? The parable of the lost sheep and the lost coin. It's not about the sheep losing. It's not about the coin being lost. It's about the seeker who wants to find that coin. The seeker who wants to find the lost sheep. The seeker who wants to find the lost son. So the, the ideal title would be the parable of the seeking father. Amen. It's not about the lost son because both were lost. One was found, the other one he wasn't found. So it's not the parable of the lost son, but it was a parable of the seeking father. Now join in me as we race through this very familiar parable and bring out certain essence of what the younger son's qualities were, what the older son's qualities were, and where does this loving father fit himself in? How do I say that this parable is a parable of a seeking father? Verse 11. We'll, we'll, we'll read all the verses that is there in this parable so that we'll have a wider understanding. Verse 11. Jesus continued that there was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to him, Father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided the property between them. So it's not about the parable of one son. The Bible clearly says he had two sons. And when will you normally divide a property in those ancient days? When will the property normally be divided? After the father dies. So this man is saying, I cannot wait for you to die, but you better give me my share of property. He is even willing to go beyond that. After the death of a fam, the father is where the property division takes place. But he says, simply says, I can't wait for you to die. That will be too much for me to wait. I want to enjoy. I want to go and have uh, fun with whatever I am going to get. So the father divided the property. And not long after, the youngest son got together all he had and set off for a distant country. And there squandered all his wealth. What does the Bible say? I'm, I'm, all of my verses are in NIV. So kindly, if you can follow NIV, that will be really good. He says, all of his wealth, he squandered it in, come on, wild living. He squandered all of his, prob all of his wealth in wild living. First of all, he goes something beyond what the norms were. He takes the property. He goes and he spends it in wild living living and after he had spent everything there was a famine in that whole country and he began to be in come on in need once he squandered all his wealth in wild living there was a famine in the country and he began to be in need so he went and hired himself to a citizen of that country who sent him to the fields to feed pigs he longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. There are three words, juxtaposed. He squandered all of his living. After he had spent everything, he had nothing and no one gave him anything. From being everything to nothing, and he is even not getting something that he wouldn't have normally had. He's deprived of, of that. And my point is this. This man who was so self-sufficient, he squandered all his property, and now he's coming to a point where he's in desperate need, and that desperate need pushes him towards something that he wouldn't have even done it. I just want to ask ourselves a question. Who was Jesus? What nationality was Jesus? Come on. Jesus was a Jew. Who is he addressing this to? To the Jews. I mean, are you, are you here? Are you with me? Jesus was a Jew and he's addressing this to the Jews. And just imagine someone going and telling to the Jew that you were sent, that a Jew was sent to go and take care of the pigs and eat what the pigs were eating. Any Jew will not even like to listen to that. 
But he says in his desperate condition, when he was in desperate need, he is being pushed into something that he would normally not want to do. The problem I find in this younger man that he was so self-sufficient. The problem with pain and pleasure, we always run towards pleasure, but we run away from pain. The problem I find, he squandered everything in wild living, and when he is in a desperate condition, what was his blessing now has turned it into a curse. What he thought that my father's property will be my blessing, I will have a secure future, I will have things on my own, I can control myself, I can drive where I am going, I can take the road map, everything I will do. And what was supposed to be his blessing turned out to be his own downfall. Are you able to follow me? The problem I see in many of us, this, this generation, is that we are so self-sufficient. Just because we have a job, just because we have a degree, just because I'm able to earn a few thousands of rupees, I think I can run my affairs of life. I think I don't need anything. I think I'm so self-sufficient that I don't need my parents, that I don't need my elders, that I don't need even God. I can run my life. I know everything. The problem, the first thing that a young teenager will say is that I know everything. Oh, I know, you don't know this, I know everything. You talk to kids. These are the things that we constantly keep hearing. So the problem is we are so self-sufficient and sometimes what God has given me as a blessing turns out to be my own reason for my downfall. This man had everything. He would have, he would have done a good lifestyle, I would believe. Abraham Lincoln, the American president, had written in 1863, when he was in office, he said this, we have been persuaded these many years in peace and prosperity. We have grown in numbers and in peace as no other nation has ever grown. But we have forgotten the gracious hand of God that persuaded us in peace and multiplied and enriched and strengthened us as a nation. We have forgotten what strengthened us and we have vainly imagined the deceitfulness of our hearts that all of these blessings are produced by some superior wisdom and virtue of our own hands. We have been vainly deceived by our hearts that all of my blessings is because of me, my wisdom, my strength and my capability. We have been intoxicated now with the unbroken success. Because I've been so successful, my mind and my eyes are closed and I believe that all of my success is because of my own capability. We have become too self-sufficient to feel the necessity of the redeeming and the pursuing grace of God. And we have become too proud to pray to the God who made us. Many of us will won't have the audacity to say these things things to God, but my heart many a times have become too proud that I don't feel the necessity of God in my life, in certain portions of my life. I may not utter these words to God, but my heart, the condition, the way that I have carried myself, I'm just giving some sort of a signal to God that I don't see you as much as important as you were God. Because I believe my success, my achievements, what I am today, it is all because of my wisdom, my strength and my own perseverance. And I have gone with the deceitfulness of my heart that everything that I have has come because of me and I don't feel the necessity of God. Maybe my heart is deceiving me to say or to come to that point where I don't feel the importance of God as much as I felt when I was in need. The same thing with this man also. Maybe he thought, maybe he thought it's self-sufficient, I can do everything on my own. But his desperate condition pushed him. And the Bible says, when he came to his senses, verse 17 please. When he came to his senses, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have food to spare? And here I am starving to death. And he says, 
I will sit and go to my father and say, Father, I have sinned against you and against heaven, and I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me as one of your hired servants. The point is this. Between wild living, to come back to his normal senses, he has to go through those difficult moments. In his wild living, he wasn't sure what he is doing. He was just, uh, just in, just in, I hear, just, just elevated. He had no control of himself. He thought that everything will fall in place. Once he came to the point of being in need, in desperate condition, once his desperate condition took hold of him, then he's coming back to his senses, to the reality of life and saying, why have I become like this? Why is my life like this? I'll go to my father. There are such good benefits in my father's house. Look at, my, look at me. Pathetic situation. I don't even have food. Leave alone food. I don't even have what the pigs eat. Even that I've been deprived of. When he comes to such desperate condition, only then his mind, he comes to his senses, to the reality that he is a person who is in need and not a person who can do everything on his own and be so caught up being self-sufficient. And once he came to his senses, he makes up his mind. He says, I'm going to go to the father and say, Father, I've sinned against you and against heaven. And I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired servants. So he prepares his repentance speech. He goes to the father. And what does the father say? What does the father react to this repentance speech? And he goes up. But when he saw his father, when he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with, come on, and was filled with compassion for him that he ran to his son, threw his arms around and kissed him. The son, you know what would have happened when the son took the share, took his estate, and when people, when neighbors, when family, when friends come to know that a younger son has divided the property and he has taken and he has squandered it in wild living, what would have been the reputation of this father in his own surroundings? Maybe the father would have been ashamed. Maybe he would have gone through a lot of hard pressing issues and questions from people around him that he was not able to answer. Even in being such a desperate condition, when the father saw the younger son from a distance, his heart is filled with compassion and he runs to him, he hugs him and he kisses him. I know this is a parable, but any respectable person, particularly in the Jewish community or in those olden days, no respectable father will run on the road and kiss and hug a son. Just imagine the president on the road when his son comes, he just runs and hugs and just imagine that. I don't, at least in those situations, no respectable father will run like that on the road because that's not a good thing. We have been used to a different sort of a culture, so we don't know that. And the son and the father meets after a while. And the father would have actually given left, right, center to the son. But the father's heart was filled with compassion. And what does the father say? Follow in. Verse 21. The son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said, You son, what have you done this to me? I want you to get out of my house and be away from you. I have nothing to do with you and me. That's what the father said, right? No, the father doesn't even allow the son to finish his repentance speech. Have you seen that? The repentance speech is still not over. While that son is talking, the father said to his servants, quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandal on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let us have a feast and we will celebrate for this son of mine was dead and is alive. He was lost and he's found. So they began to celebrate. My point was this. Just imagine what the son had done. This fellow didn't even have what the pigs 
had. He was in such a desperate condition. He just wished that my father will only accept me not as a son, but let him at least accept me as a servant. What I have done, I am not even worthy to be called a son. But when he comes home, the son is given such a grand welcome as if he has achieved something so great that the father wants to celebrate with his family and friends and neighbors. That's why I said this parable is not about the son, it's about the seeking father. Just imagine this, in you being in that situation when you have done this, and you least expect that the father will throw such a big celebration for you. You would least Im imagine that he will give you a ring. He will give you the best sandals. He will cleanse me. He will, he will make me so beautiful. He will give me so much of worth. He will give me so much of honor. I have come from such a dirty place, done something that no one would have accepted. But what I am getting from my father is something that I wouldn't have even imagined. Such was the way the father treated him. And there was a big celebration. And what did the father speak to him? Look into your Bibles. What did the father speak to the younger son? Nothing. Nothing. This man who squandered his property in wild living, who have taken, who have caused, who have brought shame to this family, to this father, the father said nothing. From self-sufficiency, he had to come back to his senses for the father to celebrate him. Meanwhile, here is another twist to the story. Meanwhile, the oldest son was in the field. When he came near the house, he heard music and dancing. So he called one of his servants and asked him what was going on. This fellow, this was so unique. This was, he's actually shell-shocked. He just stuck there. Music. Party in my house? No way. I've just gone in the fields and I come back after my work and what is this different sort of an atmosphere in my house? So he calls and this is what the servant says. Your brother has come, he replied, and your father has killed the fattened calf because he has him back safe and sound. Then the older brother begin to celebrate with the father and say, Oh father, how I wish that my younger brother has come. Let's go and have a party. The Bible says, the older brother became angry and refused to go in to his father. The older brother began to get angry. I kept saying, who were my primary audience? Who were the audience in Jesus' story? The tax collectors and the Pharisees. I want us to relate to that. Because the older man, because the son is found, he was dead, now he's alive. There is reason for the father, the entire family to celebrate because this son had gone out. He was dead, but now he's alive. But this man doesn't want to accept the fact that a son is reborn, that the son has meaning and purpose to life. He is not happy to accept a new beginning of his own brother and he becomes angry because of what is happening. And the father goes and pleads with his son. No respectable father will go down and plead with his son to come. Hey, if you want to come, you come. But the Bible says he pleads. And then, what is the response of the so-called older brother that we always say that he's a good one? The younger one is the, the lost son, the prodigal son. The older man says, but he answered his father. What does he say? NIV, what does he say? Look! Imagine a father pleading with the son outside his house and he says, look! What sort of a response to the father? He says, all these years I have been slaving for you and you have never, and I have never disobeyed your orders, yet you have never given me even a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But this son of yours, who has squandered your property with prostitutes, comes home and you kill a fattened calf for him. What does he say? He says, look, number one, that's not the way you address a father. He says, all this while I have been slaving you. If he is a slave, 
what is he telling his father has who is he projecting his father as a slave master right if i am a slave and i'm working for you i'm actually saying you are a slave master so there's no father son relationship but he says i am a slave and i've never disobeyed your orders you are not only a slave master but you have been an unjust slave master you have not even given a small portion where i can celebrate with my own friends i'm not a son to you i've been like a slave to you i've been slaving you you are a slave master but you have been an unjust slave master also but this son of yours he doesn't even have the courtesy to say my brother he doesn't want to accept him as his brother because now he feels that he has come home and he wants to divide my property he wants to his his eyes is so much on property so much on wealth and all this he doesn't want to accept the fact that the brother has come back but is more conscious that this brother who has come back who is going to divide my property further and he says this son of yours who squandered your property with prostitutes and came i don't know where he got this because the bible doesn't say he did this he's putting some more extra things and saying this is what you did the problem with this older man he was so self observed self absorbed he was just with him i me myself kind of an attitude the, the younger son he was so self sufficient the older son he was self absorbed he only want he was so concerned about him he only want he and his life and his happiness and this is what he wanted that's where he goes into further uh, into another extreme where he says i've been like a slave to you he didn't even enjoy the fact that he was a son to his father he was so self absorbed and he did not understand the love of the father what does the father reply this is the only place that the father speak he says my son the father said you are always with me and everything i have is yours but we need to celebrate and be glad because this brother of yours he doesn't say my son he again relates to him as a brother but the brother says your son the brother wants to just have nothing to do it's your son but the father is saying he is not just my son but he is your brother who was dead and is alive he was lost and he is found there was reason for the father to celebrate although he had done such a shameful thing which has brought disrespect shame to the father the father was willing to let go of everything because he is seeing the bigger picture he is seeing that this son has the possibility of living a new life therefore he goes beyond his reputation and he calls the son and he says i want to give you a new beginning and he's celebrating the fact that the son has come alive but this man who was so self absorbed doesn't even have the mind to call him a brother or take back the brother that was lost the father a selfless love we saw three components the younger son was self sufficient the older son was self absorbed the father a selfless love he went out of his way he looked beyond the shortcoming of his son he accepted and celebrated someone who has to be ridiculed and thrown away the son deserves every kind of a punishment every kind of words that you can possibly take out he has to be thrown out but what the son deserved the father didn't give what the father had he gave it to the son amen the father doesn't give me what i deserve but the father gives me what he has that is why i say it is a parable of the seeking father he did not give back what the son deserves and for us who are celebrating fathers day this this day many a times my understanding of my earthly father sometimes determines my understanding of my heavenly father because what i see what i experience the love the understanding the care the provision the responsibility of a father what i see in my father determines or gives me a picture of the heavenly father many a times if i don't have if i'm not blessed with a loving gracious and a caring father in this earth my image of the heavenly father becomes distorted because what i see and experience is totally different and i find it so difficult to come out of my experience and to look at the father the way he is 
my understanding of the earthly father distorts my understanding of my heavenly father. I just want to read a true story that happened. It's a fascinating story that comes out of an uh, 89 earthquake which flattered the place called Armenia. This deadly tremor killed over 20,000 people in less than four minutes. In the midst of all this confusion of the earthquake, a father rushed to his son's school and when he arrived to that school, the school building was just as flat as a pancake. Standing there, looking at what was left at the school after the disastrous earthquake, the father remembered a promise he made to his son. He said, son, no matter what, I'll always be for you. This is the promise that the father kept on putting it in his son's heart and in his son's ears. Son, no matter what, I will always be there for you. When the father was standing and thinking about these words that he has uttered to his son, tears began to fill his eyes. It looked like a hopeless situation, but that he could not take his mind out of his promise. The reality is this earthquake, the building is shattered, but on the other side, he's just rethinking the promise that he made. He said, I will always be with you. But when he's coming to terms with the reality that has happened and the promise that he gave his son, saying, I will always be there for you, tears starts to roll down his eyes. Remembering that his son's classroom was in the back right corner of the building, the father rushes there, and what does he do? He starts digging through the rubble, and as he was digging, other grieving parents arrived, clutching their hearts and saying, my son, my daughter, they were crying desperately, seeing the dead bodies of the son and daughter. But this father goes and he starts digging the place where this son's classroom was. And people around him said, it is too late. They would have been dead by now. Don't disturb. Just leave it. Don't be a hindrance for other parents. But this man kept on digging, kept on digging, kept on digging. He took stone by stone. He wanted to know himself whether his son is dead or alive. I don't want to hear what people say, but I want to confirm it. I want to see it myself. And in that process, he kept on taking one stone after the other. So he, he was digging for eight hours, for 12 hours, for 24 hours, and 36 hours he kept on continuously taking stone by stone in the pursuit that something possibly some hope in him doing that. And when he did that for 36 consecutive hours, in spite of people telling him not to do, as he pulled a major boulder, he heard his son's voice. He screamed his son. He says, Nathan, Nathan, are you the one? And the voice answered, Dad, it's me, Nathan. Dad, it's me, Nathan. And then the boy added these priceless words. Once he was moved, removed from there, he said these priceless words. I told the other kids not to worry. I told them that if you, my dad, was alive, you would always be there to save me. And that I will be saved. And once I am saved, you will also be saved. He kept on telling his dad, my father promised that he will always be there for me. If only my father will come, definitely he will save me out of this rubble and he will save my life. Because my father always used to tell me, I will always be there for you. And here you are, dad, keeping your promises. Once the, the son was taken out of the rebel, before taking him out of the rebel, he kept telling his friends, if only my father is alive, I will also be alive. Because my father said, son, I will always be there for you. And if my father comes, he will rescue me. And in the process of rescuing me, he will also rescue him. That is the heart, I believe, of our heavenly father. The father who promised me saying, I will always be there for you. I will rest assured. I will hold on to that assurance from my father saying, God, no matter what I go through in my life, one thing is certain that my father who has promised that he will always be there for me will be there for me. As long as my father lives, I will also live. That was the assurance that this son got. The heart of the father is loving, gracious, and compassionate. And we as his children 
Have we gone away like the, older, like the youngest son? Have we become too self-sufficient in our own minds? Have we gone away like the youngest son? Or have I been too self-absorbed with my own lifestyle, with my own personality, with my own future, with my own likings? Have I been lost in the pursuit of being my own self, success, and victory? Or do I, have I not understood the love of God? Third John, it says, the, Behold what manner of love that the Father has lavished his love upon us, that we should be called the children of God. And if, I've, if anyone sitting in this place have gone away like the younger son, or who have not understood the love of the older son, may we come back to this everlasting arms of God and say, God, you are my father, I'm your son. When God confronts you, what is your response? If you have hurt the heart of God, why don't you take time to touch the heart of God? The mind of God, the mind of this loving father is always thinking about you. The eyes of this father is always looking for you. He is watching you always. He is desperately wanted to do something good for your life. He doesn't want to see you in, in this desperate condition and pass you by. His mind is always you. You are constantly in the mind of this loving and gracious father. The ears of the father is constantly towards your side waiting to listen from you. And the heart of this father constantly wants to celebrate and show you his love. And the hands of God wants to always embrace you, always carry you, always hug you, always show you that there is an open arms that you can run any moment of your life. And the feet of God is always willing to walk with you. The shift is this. I am his son and he is my father. The sonship and the brotherhood. Because I have been adopted into the family of God. I am not, he is not my father just because he created me. That's a general term. But he is my father because he has adopted me into his family. And he has given me the right to call him Abba Father. Because of this sonship, not because of creation. I don't call him father because he created me. I call him father because of the adoption that God has granted me that I will come and be a part of the family of God. I want to just say this. The father gave up his older son to redeem his younger son and daughter and want the younger ones to be transformed into the image and likeness of his older son. God gave, the father gave his own son, Jesus Christ, to redeem us so that we will be transformed into the image and likeness of God. I believe this is the greatest privilege that anyone can have, calling God as my own father. He is not just a God, not just a holy God, not just a righteous, but I can relate to my God as father. No other people on the face of the earth has such a privilege position. But the challenge I want to bring to you as I close this morning is this. Are we sincerely making an effort to live, to love, to care, to serve, to reflect, and to resemble as his own son? The father does what he is doing. But I, who have been adopted into the family, as much as I celebrate the fatherhood of God, am I giving some opportunity for the father to celebrate me being his son. Is my lifestyle causing the father to celebrate me? Is my talk, my walk, my care, does that allow the father to celebrate me as his son? We are celebrating Father's Day this morning, this day. I want to remind all the fathers that God has entrusted a big responsibility in your care. Can we have all the fathers to stand up? We're going to pray and we're going to ask God's blessings upon our life. Shall we have all the fathers to stand up? Can I have all the married ones to also stand up? Saying, God is going to bless me with a child. I'm also going to be a father. Whatever the father has given you, are you willing to to give it back to your own children. The challenge is this. Whatever father, whatever I have received from this heavenly father, it's my duty to pass it on to my children. I am a king. I am the priest. 
I'm the prophet in my family. Am I willing or are you willing to pass it on to your children? Their fatherhood of God. That we have a gracious father. We have a loving father. This father who doesn't give me what I deserve. But he wants to give me what he has for me. My father wants to celebrate me. Fathers just lift up your hands. We are going to pray and we are going to close. Let's ask God for wisdom. For God's grace. For God's anointing. For God's understanding. For God to give strength. Raising children in this present generation is not easy. But may I pray that the father will give his grace. Will give his strength. Will give his anointing to you fathers. That you would transfer everything that the father has given to you. To your children. And as much as we celebrate you this morning. We also want to remind you of the responsibilities that God has entrusted in your care. That you would be loving, gracious, faithful, responsible fathers to your children. That you would transfer everything that the father has given to you. That you would also be a good son of the heavenly father. That the father will celebrate us. Shall we also, all of us stand as we pray for the fathers and we will close. Father this morning. Our hearts are filled with gratitude. Lord, we want to thank you for such amazing love. Lord, we don't know what you saw in us. Lord, we are also like that younger son. So dirty. Lord, so guilty. So filled with sin. Lord, we have done things that we shouldn't have done. But Lord, in spite of you giving us what we deserve, you are giving us what you have. Lord, when you have come to you with shame and with guilt, Lord, you are a God who celebrates us. And give us a new beginning. And Father, we want to thank you for that. And God, I pray for all our fathers in this church. I pray, God, that you would continue to be with them. Lord, we thank you that they are a blessing to the family. That they are a blessing to the church and to the community. And God, I pray that you would bless them with wisdom. Bless them with strength. With your anointing. That they will pass it on to their children. Whatever you have entrusted into their cares. I pray, God, that you would build them. That they will build children. In the ways that you want us, O oh God. And Lord, we pray and we wish all our fathers a happy Father's Day. I pray, God, that you would continue to lavish your love upon all of our fathers and our church believers this morning. As we celebrate you. As we celebrate the fatherhood of God. That there is love, compassion, care, comfort in the arms of God. That the heart of God is always for me. With that assurance, O oh God, we move this place fully knowing that the father who promised me that he will always be with me will never leave me or forsake me my life is in the safe hands of my father with that assurance we bless your children O oh god send us home with your blessings that we will celebrate you this day and always as a loving and a gracious father bless us O oh god in jesus name we pray Amen. And now with the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, the fellowship and the communion of the Holy Spirit, rest and abide with us now and forevermore. Amen.